with us tonight, Dr. Atazi, who works where you've met, uh, you've met Merrick Sikorovich before we had Sabrina Agnoni, easy for him to say, and, uh, and Darlene has been up here too. And so uh, we have Dr. Tazi who is heading up some of the SOD1 studies, along with others that I'll let him tell you about. But we just, um, once again, our people from Boston, we tried to get this driver to come out of the car. I said, I'm afraid to get out of Boston. It might be bears. It might be cows or something like that. Tell them we'll save them. We'll save them from that. I think he did come out, so I'll make him feel part of the community if you see him at all. Uh, we've already got some appointments going that he's coming back and bringing his whole team. He didn't say that, but I'm saying that now. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's bringing his whole team here because he works with Biogen, which is a, a big bio, what are they? Big biotechnology company. <laughs> Big biotechnology company. And uh, they are putting some money into these studies. And uh, with the ice bucket, which by the way, many of the people who are sitting here were part of ice bucket two years ago, a year ago. Raise your hand if you've got water <laughs> on your head. <laughs> yeah. And if you didn't, we can arrange that tonight. For those who do not raise a hand, they'll find that also. Um, so he said, he's got some slides, and we're so high tech up here uh, that he's taking a picture of our tech team. <laughs> And a uh, picture of our most up-to-date screen. <laughs> it's, flashing. It, it's even flashing. Yeah, yeah. And we don't even have electricity up here. <laughs> we don't even have electricity up here. So um, he's going to tell us what the latest things are that are happening. And you are going to be... Um, anointed, so to speak, of being an ambassador and spreading any of this word to anyone you know. Because all of the money that we've raised over all these years, and the ice bucket here, so it's like an on Campbell Green in the community, we sent $40,000. money and have it for a variety of things, but if you don't get patients being part of these studies, when you're part of these studies, you get the best doctors in the world. You get the cutting edge medicine that's not even on the market yet. And you get total wonderful scenery ride, unless you're riding with Craig. <laughs> 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 but 
Start with the first slide. If it works. <laughs> All right, perfect. Can you hear me in the back if I yeah. speak loud? Perfect. Right. Closer. All right. I have to keep going back and forth. So um, the first. The first point that I want to make is the importance of technology in order to advance the disease. So newer technologies can help us diagnose the disease earlier. So if you don't know ALS in general, it takes one year, over one year, to get the diagnosis because we don't have a diagnostic test. So it's not like diabetes. You go to the doctor, they take blood, they check it, in an hour they tell you you have diabetes your blood sugar is high. So there's a test that tells you you have a disease. ALS, you have to wait and wait and wait and see multiple doctors, different specialties. On average, patients with the disease, they see three different, not doctors, three different specialties. An ear, nose, uh, throat doctor, a gastroenterology doctor, a stomach doctor, um, a neurologist. They see many doctors before they get the diagnosis. It's a big problem because if we have a treatment that would stop the disease. We want to stop it as early as possible in the disease. So we're working on ways to improve the diagnosis of the disease. The other problem that imaging or technology can help us with is to efficiently and quickly tell if the drug is working or not. And I'm going to show you a few images, few pictures from people with ALS. 
to kind of demonstrate these um, these advantages of technology and imaging. So if you look at the picture in the middle, and maybe I'm just going to go and show you here. These are all imaging studies that you inject a, uh, a contrast, but it's a special contrast. It's not the usual contrast, the research contrast. And then you take a picture of the brain, and what you see here is inflammation in the brain. So you're seeing if, they, if the brain is inflamed. So it tells you two things, where the inflammation is and how much inflammation there is. And then the top and bottom pictures are pictures from other labs in the world. The first one was actually 12 years ago, 2004, a long time ago. And the one at the bottom is 2012, four years ago. This is our, this is what we're doing at MGH, this picture over here. Do you see this area here that it's red here? That's the area that controls the movements in the disease. That's the area that we know is affected in ALS. And that's the area where we see and measure inflammation. So we were able to take a picture of the brain and see if there is an inflammation or not. And I'll tell you why this is important. It's important because if you look, these are the people with ALS and these are the people who don't have ALS. There is inflammation here compared to here. There is inflammation here compared to here. And there is inflammation here compared to here. The disease can start in the arms, legs, or can, can start in the mouth with swallowing. These are the people who had the disease starting in the arms and legs, and these are the people who had the disease starting in the, in the mouth area. The people who had the disease starting in the, in the arms and legs, the arms and legs areas on the, in the brain is inflamed. And people who have the disease starting in the mouth, the area in the brain that controls the mouth is inflamed. And then, when you look at this row over here, and this, <laughs> this, this uh, column over here, this column over here, probably you don't need to be a radiologist to tell which one represent patients with ALS and which one represents people who don't have ALS. You can clearly see the red spots on the left column. So you don't need to be a radiologist. I don't know why people go to medical school and study you know, 12 years to become a radiologist. It's pretty simple. You can see it right over here. I can guarantee you, if you take any other imaging modalities, if you take an MRI of the brain, you go to the hospital or CT scan or anything that is currently available, the answer is normal. It looks normal for the same people. So this is one of the very advanced research tracers or research, research contrasts that we're using at MGH to measure inflammation in the brain for people with the disease. And I'll explain why this is important after answering a question from there. Yes? I, you know, say kind of, you know, I'm not a doctor or anything like that, but uh, the same formations and stuff is a lot like Parkinson's do. You know, with the different areas of the brain that create the same neuro, neuro, neurological problems. People, do you agree or? I fully agree. The question is, is this, is this similar to Parkinson's? Do we see something similar in Parkinson's? And the answer is, Parkinson is a different disease. Yes, it is. And clinically, is a different disease. But there is also a similar. But doesn't it break the inflammation in the same amount of area of the brain? As it does have that? inflammation in different areas of the brain. Different areas. Certain Different areas. Different areas in the brain. Exactly. And that's why imaging is important. Because, let's say we measure <coughs> something in blood. We don't know where this is coming from. The blood washes all over our body. So we don't know if it's coming from the muscle, from the brain, from... We have no idea. The, the value of imaging, you know exactly where, right? <coughs> the location right. of where the problem is coming from. But these areas that you're showing us here are very similar too. 
that's very specific to ALS, the areas that I'm showing okay. you, yep. is exactly the areas that we know are affected in ALS. Thank you. Exactly the areas that are affected in ALS. So, message number one, this could have major implications on early diagnosis. And that's why we're actually offering this. So this is this is in people who already have the disease. Now we're offering the same study for people who have a gene that is positive, but they don't have the disease yet. Because we want to know how far back we can go and see these changes. We want to know maybe these changes started years before people had the disease. And that's why if anybody knows that they have the gene and they would like to come we were offering this study for people who <coughs> healthy otherwise but they carry the gene because we want to understand what happens even before people develop the disease okay what's yes what's the difference between a standard mri with contrast versus the study you've got two big differences this is a study that is using a research tracer, which is a research contrast. That contrast is not the same as the one that is available everywhere. Actually, this contrast, they make it in, in a, a place called radiochemistry lab. So you need like a dedicated lab that actually makes these tracers, and they make it from scratch almost every time we have a patient in the scan. This tracer lives for 20 minutes it has a 20 minute half life. So it starts decaying. So it's not like another hospital exactly. can have you the have contrast. You have to make it wow. next to where the patient and where the scanner is. So you have the patient already in the scanner and the people are making this tracer in the radiochemistry lab. You take it out and literally run and inject to take these images. We're working also on other type of tracers that have a longer half life that would allow us to transport and make in the morning and use throughout the day, so working on that as well. Awesome. So that's one big difference, is the tracer. The second big difference, this is not MRI. This is something called PET, positron emission tomography. Different technology. It just happened that we have one of the unique machines in the world that actually is an MRI scanner, and it has a small PET scanner inside of it that it's MRI compatible. So when we acquire these images, we get MRI and PET data at the same time, at exactly the same time. So that's another difference. Okay, so how is, so that's, that's why this is helpful to make an early diagnosis, and that's why it's important to make an early diagnosis. Then how is that gonna help us to develop new treatments. That's our goal. We want to develop new treatments. I said this technology would help us to tell very quickly if a drug works or not. So if you look here, the model here is that you have a small number of patients on the top, on the top left, that will have inflammation in the brain. And then within weeks, you give them a drug A or drug B or drug C. And within weeks, you look at the inflammation in the brain. And if you see that the inflammation goes down to normal, you already know that the drug went to the brain, caused something called the blood-brain barrier. The brain is behind like a, 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 an iron curtain. Not a lot of things go to the brain. The drug went to the brain. It's true. It's a big challenge Some days for drug that's development. The I... For drug development, it's a big problem. You give drugs. Our body is designed that the brain will pick out anything, pick everything out. And this is a way we're built so infections and, and, and bad things don't get to the brain. But that works on drugs as well. So the brain is, is really protective. But if, when you have a drug, that protection actually works against the drug. So getting the, dr the, the drug through the barrier, the blood-brain barrier, is very tough. But if you see that the inflammation goes away after a few weeks of treatment, you know that your drug went and crossed that blood brain barrier. Not only that, but also went all the way to the area where the we know where the problem is and actually did what it's supposed to do. And you can see it. So this is a lot of inf inf information that would help you to say, well, 
I did three drugs, only one of them accomplished that. That's the one I'm going to take to a large clinical trial where I want to give it to people and see if they improve clinically or not. So this is a, an efficient way to screen drugs in people. We screen a lot of drugs in mice. We had a lot of things that work in mice. You take them to people, they don't work. We want to develop drugs for people, not for mice. So we, we are trying to screen drugs in people. And this is how you screen drugs in people. You need something to read. Diabetes drugs, very easy. Same example. Take a blood test, high glucose. Give insulin, low glucose. You know very quickly that the drug works. Very quickly. Have you found a, a long-term drug that has in your trials that has worked with people? You know, some that has been long-term that has kept that Not yet. This is very new technology. Just, just you have tried samples that have gone to, which is hope. Which is hope. This is very new technology. We published our results last year, 2015. And now, after we did that, we have three drugs that are actually going through this, this phase, this Trial. model. Three drugs Trial. and clinical trials using this imaging technology as the way to see if these drugs work or not. And all of these three drugs are industry-sponsored drugs. They're pharmaceutical companies knocking on our door saying, could you please take our drug and test it and see if it works in ALS through this technology. So that's one. Yes, you have a question. Um, are any of these drugs aromatic? The question is, any of the, are any of these drugs armoclamol? Armoclamol is a drug that was in clinical trials for ALS in general in the past, and it didn't work. And then it was in ALS for SOD1 ALS recently, and the data is not published yet. We never tried armoclamol using this technology. The company that makes armoclamol doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. So, the first thing is that I showed you is how you give a drug and you know quickly that it actually works before you take it to a large study, very expensive study. These very large studies cost millions and millions of dollars. One of the recent <coughs> drug studies that was done in ALS and it was a very large study to look at clinical improvement, cost, the cost for that, for that study was over a hundred million dollars. A hundred million dollars. So these are very expensive and there's only a limited amount of resources to try these drugs. And that's why you need something efficient and relatively cost effective where you can do a lot of these small studies, screen drugs in people, and then take the ones that are very promising to these very expensive and very long studies. So that's the idea. That's that's the first model. Second model. Is the disease the same in every person? And the answer is probably not. We have different genes that are supposed to do different things, but they're all cause the same disease that it looks, you know, in terms of muscle weakness and atrophy. We have people within the same family with the same disease, with the same gene, exact same gene. Some of them develop the disease at age 40, and some of them develop the disease at age 60, and some of them develop the disease at age 90. Why? <coughs> same gene, same problem. Why there's a lot of differences? So, although the disease is looks the same to us, probably there are different drivers of the disease in each person. So, if we develop a drug and we give it to everybody who has different mechanisms for the disease, even if one of them improves we're not, or, or slow down disease, we're not going to be able to pick that up. So, going back to imaging, you could use this technology to screen people before they enter a study. Let's say you have a drug that works on inflammation. Don't you want to enroll people with a lot of inflammation in that study? Because the people who don't have inflammation in the brain, probably they wouldn't benefit from that study. 
So this is this is a very powerful way to identify the people that will respond to treatment. And this is this is the way that you can actually um, really efficiently develop drugs. It, it's called personalized medicine. I look at you, I take a picture of your brain, you have a lot of inflammation, you would benefit from an anti-inflammatory. You don't have inflammation, you have a different problem in the brain. You have a different drug that is gonna help. Maybe it's not all sides fits all. And that's why we've been struggling for years and years and years to find treatment for this disease. So this is where these type of technologies can also help. So moving from the technology of imaging to the treatments. What's going on for treatments for people with the genetic forms of the disease? People with SOG1, like the family over here. I'm saying gene therapy is around the corner, which is true. So, we have a clinical trial at MGH right now that will identify the gene and then have a solution for that. The problem here in, in people who have that gene, the gene is the problem. We know what's started the whole disease. It's that gene. We are 100% sure that that's, that's the cause of the disease. So that's the problem. Okay, the problem is SOD1 mutation. We can see it, we can identify it. And then we have the solution, which is gene therapy. It's a very specific therapy. It's a key in the law therapy. The drug recognizes the bad gene and only the bad gene and it goes there and takes care of it. It dissolves that protein that comes from that bad gene. So it's very specific treatment for the cause of the disease. And this is, it sounds like science fiction when you hear about it, right? Like you can identify a gene and then you have like a, that's the kind of lock and you have a key that you can unlock it and block it and all of that. It sounds like science fiction, but it's happening. We have a trial that does exactly that. And this is a trial that is actually now enrolling at MGH. We actually dosed, I dosed the first person, a person who has SOG1 gene. I gave that person the first dose in that <coughs> and, it's, and it's And I can tell you, it felt really, really good to do that. The dose is not a pill, actually. The dose, because of the iron curtain, <laughs> you have to administer that drug in the spinal fluid. So you have a, just like a spinal tap, some people have a spinal tap in the back, you go in the back and you have a needle, and we always used to collect fluid, and that's it. In this case, we did the spinal tap, and then we had the treatment, and we have to inject the treatment through the spinal tap, and that goes and washes the brain in all these areas that are affected. So, it's happening, we're enrolling for anybody who has the disease and has the SOD1 gene, this is a study that it's enrolling right now. And once again, the, the best doctors in the world, MGH, Mass General, and you don't pay to be part of these trials either. It's like these studies are free of charge and actually there are programs built into these studies where if you need to spend an overnight in Boston, the study will pay for overnight stay. we we'll pay for all the transportation. We'll pay for a caregiver to be there and stay in a, in a hotel. So these are absolutely no charge. If anything, right. there is compensation for, for you to be part of these studies. And that's why other people know some people with ALS or have been diagnosed. We've got to get that word out. That's how these Studies progress. Exactly. So ALS is a rare disease, and SOD1 is even more rare. So although this, you know, therapy looks very promising, it's not easy actually to find <coughs> patients who have SOD1 and qualify for the study. So it's definitely participation and getting the word out is very, very important. Very important for the success of this. Question. Is your research in conjunction with Dr. Brown and EMS? Thank you for the question. The question is, is this research in conjunction with Dr. Brown at UMass? 
Dr. Brown is the person who discovered the SOG1 gene. Dr. Brown used to be at MGH up until a few years ago, and he moved to UMass. The reason that he moved to UMass is the SOD1 gene. The reason he moved to UMass is because there was somebody working on technology that can silence the, the gene. So he wanted to partner with that person to develop therapy, gene therapies for SOD1. So what he did, he has now viral therapies. Going back to the Iron Curtain, I don't know why I keep looking at you when you go to the Iron Curtain. Going back to the question about Iron Curtain. So viruses, they have ways to get in to the brain, and they have ways to get in within our genes. They can incorporate within our genes. Actually, about 5% of our genes is virus genes. Our, the human in general, we have like 5% of our genes that are from virus. They're not, they're not human genes, they're virus genes. They just come in, incorporate themselves, and just stay there. Most of the time, they don't do anything. They just, but they're able to do that. But what Bob Brown is working on is gene therapy within a virus that goes through the Iron Curtain, goes to the brain, and incorporate themselves. But when they incorporate themselves over there, they stop the gene, the SOD1 gene, from making the code. So another fascinating technology. This hopefully will be in trial in patients next year. Next year. Thank you for Dr. your question. Johnson, we've been waiting for this. This was not available for flip. It was not available for Mary. It was not available for Curtis, who had Dr. Brown back then in, in his time, and Dennis and everyone else. So this is major stuff, folks, that this is now available. And part of that had to do with funding, too, of well, Absolutely. ice buckets. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have another question. Yes. Um, where, is, where is the FDA with the um, compassionate use? So the question is, where does the FDA stand in terms of compassionate use of medication? I can tell you that from my own experience, the FDA is actually very willing to provide compassionate care. They even have a compassionate care track within their applications. There is a whole section within the FDA, it's called compassionate use of medications, and they have three different levels of compassionate is that care. New? Is no, that it's been there for a while. They have compassionate care on an emergency basis when they, you can't wait, you know, you need to get that within 24 hours or within, they have that, and it's for one patient. They compassionate care for non-emergency cases and for one patient, and they have another compassionate care for a small number of people that would need that treatment. However, and that's the important piece here, they are there, the FDA is there really to protect safety. And if they know that any of these compassionate care drugs will cause harm or potential to cause harm, then they would say we can't let this. We can't get. We, you can't do this compassionate care because although you think that there is nothing, you know, it can get worse than this. Actually, it can because there are medications that make things worse, and we've seen that in the past. So, the FDA. Just remember, all the information from all the trials from all the drug companies go to the FDA. The FDA actually knows the most about what's going on because everything goes to them. And all these are very confidential information. There's a, a company developing a drug and talk to the FDA about it and all that. Very confidential. So nobody would know about it. But FDA is really the, the kind of centralized place where they really know what's going on. And I can tell you, for nobody's perfect, for most of the times, they were right and they were reasonable. What about caring for people who are at risk? So now we, we're trying to take this really beyond just waiting until the disease happens. 
and then try to take care of it. We want to take care of it before the disease happens. We actually, we don't want the disease to happen. Isn't that the goal? Yeah. If you have the gene, the goal is, we know you have the gene. Okay, what can we do about it right now when you're healthy so you never develop the disease? So we already started to think about that and build infrastructure for that. So we have a brain health clinic. And the picture over there, not of the vegetables in the brain, but the picture on the top right corner is Katie Nicholson, Dr. Nicholson at MGH. She's an ALS doctor, and she actually is leading that, that ALS clinic. It's an ALS clinic for people who have the gene, or they have a family member, they don't know if they have the gene, they have a family member who has the disease, and they want to get checked, and they want to participate in the research. So that's a clinic that is open for anybody with a family history or at risk of developing the disease. And within that clinic, there is a whole infrastructure built. Care is a big part of it, and monitoring is a big part of it, but also research. So going back to the imaging study as an example, this is a study where you can participate in before you have the disease, if you have the gene. So you go to that clinic, even that clinic, even if you don't have the disease, they will offer you a research study that would help us prevent the disease from happening. So we're working in all directions, and with one focus is to prevent the disease from happening, and if it happens, to stop it as early as possible. That's the goal. I think that's my last slide. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take more questions and answer, I'm sure, People have more questions. Yes, please. Um, what what is going on with Emory University in addition to what you're doing at NTH and what's happening to Do you work separately? Do you work together? Um, I know that uh, Dr. Benatar was down there. I don't think he's there anymore. But um, is there like a team effort going on, or is it everybody doing their own little research? Yes. So let me repeat the question. The question is, are you guys working each one alone? Or the ALS doctors working together as one team? And I can definitely say that we are actually a very tight team, that we all work with each other, all of us. And actually, we work with each other at different capacities. So I'm going to give you a few examples. We have the Northeast ALS Consortium. The name Northeast, because it started in the Northeast by five centers 20 years ago. But now it's a consortium of doctors and centers for ALS clinical trials that has over 100 centers in the US and beyond. We have international centers as well. They all go to the same meeting every year. They all have multiple projects with each other, and they're all talking to each other and working with each other all the time. And you mentioned Dr. Benatar at University of Miami. He is part of that team. And actually, him and I are co-chairs of the imaging core for the Northeast ALS Consortium. We work very closely together with each other, and actually even with our European counterparts. So we work like even with a, with a European group uh, for ALS as well. Another example of working together, a new initiative is called Boston One. Actually, it's called ALS One after Boston One. Boston One was like a big uh, fundraising that happened after the Boston Marathon bombing. It's a Boston One fund, so a lot of people donated money. This is ALS One, modeled after that. It started with a patient who actually wanted, who looked, developed ALS and then looked around him and he, he lives in Boston. And he, he went all over the world and all over the US and then went back to Boston and said, I think here in Boston we have the best institution to take care of this disease. And I don't know why I'm going all over. I want to actually start something for Boston because we have the pharmaceutical company who are working together to kind of develop ALS drugs with physicians, Dr. Brown, who found the, the gene, Merit Sukovic, who started the Northeast ALS Consortium, and everybody 
everybody is within like three miles basically from, from each other, all talking to each other. So he created this ALS1 group to actually bring people even more to with each other and, and then do projects together. So just to get up, uh, that's a long answer, but the short answer is definitely work very closely with each other. Um, not only in the US, but even with, with our European counterparts and Japanese also. I was in Japan in, in November and trying to kind of do projects together uh, with the groups over there. So it's a very tight community, very tight community. Dr. Tassi? Yes. Um, I am a patient of Dr. Benatar's. I'm also a patient of yours, and I know that what the tests that you they do on me in Miami, you know about, and he knows about. I went through that machine. Um, probably one of those brains up there was mine. <laughs> um, it, was the, it was the little teeny one. Okay? <laughs> I know it's that not this one. <laughs> but I hope it's the one that doesn't have it. But um, I do know that you you both all work together, and, it, and it's really important, I feel, for people that could or even don't have the gene yet, or if they go and sign up to be tested. I know I've been down several times once for just skin cells. I grow from here to Boston and give skin cells. But it may help in the long run, so that's why we're so passionate about this. Absolutely. Anything helps. Your participation, we have projects that go from a simple blood drop that you have in the lab every, you know, very frequently anywhere. A simple blood drop all the way to very invasive, very, um, you know, uh, complicated clinical trials where, as I mentioned, we inject drugs right, you know, into the, the spinal fluid. So, and skin and imaging and so we have a lot of programs and again I can sit with my team in a conference room and talk forever but without participation we can never find a treatment. That's we the need, important that's part. That's the important part. We it need patients. We need people to participate. Absolutely. There's another question over there. You know why uh, you lost to the battery in about a year and see the market Good for him, but why is he still yeah. alive after 30 years and put the Mary in Yes, so the question is, why Stephen Hawking had the disease for 20 plus years and he's still alive and other people die from the disease very quickly? And that goes to the problem that although we think it's the same disease in every person, because it looks similar, probably it's different diseases that we put under one umbrella. As I said, same family, same gene. Some people develop fast disease, some people develop slow disease. Some people develop disease at young age, some people develop at old age. It's the same family, same gene. What about everybody else? There's a lot of extremes of the disease. There are very slow and progressive forms of the disease. There are very fast progressive forms. Stephen Hawkins had one of those that actually starts at a very young age, but it was a slowly progressive form of the disease. And he's alive, but he's alive, you know, completely quadriplegic with the ventilator, you know, a, a machine that pushes air in and out for years now. So he's, he's, he's alive, but also there's a lot of intervention to keep him, keep him alive. But sorry, but the, but the imaging and the technology hopefully would help us to differentiate what's driving the disease and why people have different disease progression rates. And that would basically tailor the personalized <coughs> medicine and the personalized treatment for each person. So I totally agree with you. Probably Stephen Hawking, he would need a different treatment than somebody else would need because probably it's a different disease. If you put them all together in one study, even if one of them slows down, you would never be able to be done. So this new <coughs> meds would help people on the onset of ALS today? To stop the onset of yes. ALS? Yes. There are no medications. If you know you have the gene, there's no, we don't have any medication no. now that no. would stop this from happening. That is correct. Okay. There you go. That's why the newest stuff coming yeah. down yeah. is trying yeah. to yeah. eliminate that SD1 <coughs> gene. Yeah. Listen to me, I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> 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 Very lay person standpoint, you know. It, 
it goes in on viruses, though. What takes that medicine in? It's the only thing that will penetrate that cell. Uh, and that's it. So the find, if it does that, if they can shut down that gene, gene. then it, would it wouldn't. Get first, it's trying to keep working with the symptoms, yeah. shut down the gene. And it has repercussions. It has far-reaching <laughs> possibilities for Parkinson, for hunting, for Deschens. Is that how you say it? Deschens, yeah. Uh, the childhood um, disease. So this is way beyond us. And to think we're up in this corner in a tent in Vermont <laughs> with Dr. Tazi is a great honor. And thank you so much.